This is Raw, a podcast by Greta Pools. Series two is The Nature Cure. Many of the interviews for this series of Raw were done before or in 2020. I interviewed Judy Jacker on the 11th of January in 2019 by phone from her home in Melbourne. Judy, along with husband Alf, have played a seminal role in establishing naturopathy in Australia. Judy is known for her clinical practice work as a naturopath and also as a spiritual healer. She is an author and pioneered the development of formal educational courses and qualifications in naturopathy. Judy founded the Jacker Foundation for Natural Therapies. She fought several battles to secure regulatory outcomes for complementary health in Australia. Judy was still practising as an energy healer and naturopath at the age of 80 when we spoke by phone. Sadly, Judy Jacker is no longer with us. She passed away in March of 2022 at the age of 83. Fail Judy. My name's Judy Jacker and I'm one of the elders of the naturopathic profession. I'm actually over 80. I turned 80 last August and I've been in practice for 47 years and that's using a synthesis of herbs, minerals, vitamins, homeopathy and various types of energy healing. So I've seen a lot of changes take place in the profession over the years and I helped found the Southern School of Natural Therapies with Alf Jacker and it's now been established for many decades and we were the first in Victoria to obtain degree accreditation for our course. So it's been a, a big journey and I've been cleaning out my filing cabinet the last few days over Christmas and I realised just what a journey it's been. A very exciting one, sometimes very frustrating very challenging, and so that's my story in a nutshell. Um, uh, Judy, you mentioned spiritual healing, and I noticed that when you were uh, a young nurse um, in the uh, hospital system that you, your mother began exploring spiritual healing and it interested you. So can you tell us a little bit about those early years when you uh, were started to look into alternative therapies? Well, originally I was unable to find any books on natural therapies, so most of the books were on uh, the spiritual aspect of healing that I came across. And I was working in casualty with a man who became very well known for other reasons, Bert Rumwainer, who pioneered the, tip, the cause of the whole thing of abortion. And um, I asked him one day whether he believed in spiritual healing, and he said, go to the Theosophical Bookshop and join the library and explore those. So I did, and that, that was about the only source in Melbourne you could find any books on healing. Uh, and I came across the anthroposophical medicine, which was interesting, and I'm still interested in that to some extent. Um, and the, the story with the mother, my mother, was quite separate. She was in the Anglican Church, a devout member of the Anglican Church, and, she, and they formed a spiritual healing group under the auspices of a woman called Eleanor Lindsay, who came from Scotland, I think. Um, so she used to go really to that. But that was a more in the church type of approach and didn't really appeal to me much. Um, so I, mine was a separate... Uh, st stemming from those words of Bert Wainer that, that, that is of what could be found in the Theosophical Bookshop, um, I, I went and read and devoured any books on mainly theosophy in those days, uh, and that was based on the uh, Eastern religions, etc., Hinduism in particular. Um, and so that was my introduction, and I just started on my own... I, I started my own system of meditation, Vipassana, I suppose you'd call it. Vipassana, is that how you say it? Um, and then I joined the Arcane School and did the more formal meditations and visualisations that they had. So <laughs> that's the story of the introduction to the type of healing. Um, Judy, one of the concepts that interests you and also interests me is how energy throws, uh, flows through our bodies and connects us with the world. 
um, there is this idea of vibration. Can you tell us a little bit how this works and what role you think that this plays in our physical and mental health? Well, this is an area I'm particularly interested in and I'd like to make that my final focus for this life, if you like. Um, <clears throat> and I think there is a basis in physics and certainly it's well known that most things have a frequency, whether it's a herb or a food or uh, even some man-made things, they have a, a frequency. Uh, and we know that uh, there are harmful frequencies and that's an area that I'm particularly concerned about with microwaves being emitted and children being exposed in schools with their laptops and their phones and everything else. Um, I think it's going to be a huge problem in a fairly short time and so I'm, in, I'm interested to alert people to both the good side of vibration and the poor side. Um, but radio waves and microwaves are the ones we're concerned about and uh, herbs and homeopathy work on the opposite end of the scale, re reverting our distorted vibrations into healthy ones. Uh, and I've come across a number of different practitioners over the years in, in this area uh, and um, they've mainly been ostracised by science and governments, etc. Um, so it's a matter of bridge, somehow bridging between the science. So I've, I've actually done a bit of that in my books but I'd like to do more and I did a lecture, uh, not a lecture, um, a big article for uh, ACNAM, Australasian Oh, what does it stand for? Anyway, it's a medical group, basically, um, but with many people in that group interested in alternatives. And so uh, I did an article on waveforms and waves and vibrations and frequency, and the editor at that time said that he had more positive response and inquiries about my article than for a long time. So I thought, well, the time's definitely right. And I, if I hadn't been so busy last year with other things, I would have got stuck back into some writing. But any future writing I do will tend to be along those lines because I think for both positive reasons and, and uh, saving our kids from destructive tendencies in their energy field, we need to be alerted. So how do the energy fields work? How does this um, work in the naturopathic theory? Uh, well... The basic, the, the two pillars of naturopathy, as you're probably well aware, are building up vitality and removing toxins. So it's the vitality aspect that's here focused on, um, and it's a way of expressing vitality. The, the basic uh, vibration of the earth is about seven hertz, meaning seven cycles, seven waves per second. Um, so that's one little tiny example. And then medicines all have different wavelengths, as I've said with herbs as well. Um, and there are certain positive wavelengths and, and the whole universe is tended to be built on vibration and frequency. Um, I watched a very interesting video the other night on uh, which gave a... a it was called... Um, oh, now it slipped my mind, but... It was a, a project by some physicists who were interested in healing as well. And, and um, I thought, well, we're really getting somewhere now, but it's well away from the, being able to convince scientists and politicians. So the, our main problem is politicians. So politicians with the various greed pushing from their people and their electorate um, don't want to have any control on microwaves and f cell phones and uh, tower, micro towers that supply those phones with energy. Uh, so that's our big problem. It's the greed of humanity that won't let this new understanding of energy and waves go ahead. Um, Judy, um, you're still practising naturopathy today. Yes. And you've um, you've built up um, your own naturopathic your own naturopathic business, yet you've also put a lot of effort into 
founding the school of natural th- the Southern School of Natural Therapies, um, and I and and worked very hard to develop a curriculum for naturopathy. Um, what motivated you, and um, how do you think the curriculum stands today? Well, of course, we've sold the, bus- the we sold the educational aspect of the Southern School, and we've used the money from the building, which they didn't want, to fund various scholarships and re- research in particular, especially with the National Institute of Complementary Medicine, or NICM. Um, but going back further, when I first became interested in, this, in the whole subject and attended Alf Jacker's course, as it was then, he practised uh, the lecturing four nights a week in his spare time, um, and I realised the curriculum was a bit too basic then, and so I offered to help. And so I started building up both the science side and the naturopathic side. I looked for people in the science side. I said we had initially we had fifth year and sixth year medical students uh, teaching, for instance, pathology and biochemistry, and and then in, in the naturopathic sector we, sector we just picked out some outstanding examples of people we knew were very successful in practice in the herbal area, the iridology section, uh, homeopathy, you know, clinical nutrition, and we gradually built that up. And so eventually we applied for accreditation. Um, it was knocked back once, but with a proviso that we fixed up some fairly minor areas, which we did. And so we got our uh, accreditation in wait, what year was that? Ninety eighties. In the ninety two. Oh, ninety two. Yeah, it's ninety two. Um. So um, that's how we proceeded, and uh, unfortunately, um, I'd been involved for years and years, and I felt like retiring from when I then became chairperson of the college. Uh, there was nobody who took on the research side. And so Endeavour College has done a very good job with the research side and we've been a bit slack in terms of the people that are now running the college haven't got going with that in in, in, in any great style. So um, we're probably not seen as a leader in research anymore, but we've been very happy to, to supply other people, such as Nickham, with the funds to go ahead with research, and Nick Nick and and other bodies are doing a lot of work. And we've seen that um, integrative medicine is now um, a part of the Southern Cross University. Um, It's a government-funded university, and they were, you say, the first to establish an atropathy degree program. So um, do you think that this is um, uh, part of the future for naturopathy? In universities, you mean? Yes. Well, I think so. Although it's, there's always the danger if it's not, there's not some work at the private sector that it'll get lost in um, the big guys. Um, so, but it's definitely, obviously, going to proceed in a scientific manner. The whole curriculum unfoldment, and um, and I think that's good as long as we don't lose the essence. In talking to naturopathic educators, the last couple of years. Uh, both locally and internationally, I've been informed that, um, that that we're losing the essence of the naturopathic philosophy and I certainly agree with that with what I've discovered in terms of students sitting in with one in clinical practice and they, they say they just have not been taught the basics and they are very sad about that. Um, so there is a danger that we'll lose essence as big business and science steps in. Um, Judy, just going back to the energy healing uh, side of things and vibrations, um, can you give me some examples of um, some of your patients that you've worked with, how, where this has been a factor in their um, health problems and how you've worked to help uh, them improve their health? Well, we noticed over the decades that uh, that's the first sign that our treatment's working when people have more energy and they sleep better, have less headaches, that sort of thing. Um, and so it's, it's uh, always a sign to us that things are working when they have more vitality. Um, 
I'm just trying to think of a particular case. They all they all respond to the more esoteric healing in terms of they feel comfortable with it, they feel serene. Um, some of them have specific examples of why they felt better and the way that they felt better with the healing. And it's a very simple sort of healing we follow. It's um, based on the works of Alice Bailey and... Um, I've been running courses in that for about 20 years uh, and there's a, quite a big international group that are involved with that um, and it's actually called now the International Network of, of Esoteric Healing and then it switched to esoteric to energy healing so they now call themselves International Network of Energy Healing. Um, so... And what happens? What? How? Do, how what are the therapies? What are the? What are the teachings of that group? So, well, it's based on the Trans Himalayan teaching, coming from originally Hinduism, I suppose you'd say, but but very specifically modulated for the Western mind and the Western needs, um, and it's particularly looking at the theory of the etheric body or energy field, getting back to vibration, etc. And we have various techniques. We use a lot of visualisation and we work with what the energy centres call the chakras, which is related to the endocrine system. Um, and so each healing includes a balancing of the energy centres or chakras. Uh, plus we do have a sort of lymphatic drainage technique we use, circulatory technique, nerve balancing um, all these things are included and it's a quite a quick process. We usually only have somebody in our room doing that process for about maximum of 20 minutes. Um, nobody that I know has ever been adversely affected by it. So it's been something I've re re rejoiced in continuing. Um, Judy, it, it sounds like there's a lot of people, uh, probably something yet to discover for a lot of people in this, um, people who have discovered it obviously, but... Um, um, perhaps uh, there's a lot more to be discovered in that field. Absolutely. Yes, it's um, an ongoing adventure. Um, Judy, uh, it sort of struck me that um, you uh, were quite dynamic in um, in following your own path at, from an early age, um, from in your 20s when you were nursing to, to reading up on... Um, uh, philosophies and therapies that weren't really mainstream in the, in that era. That's true, Greta. And um, you then sort of threw and you you started to establish your own naturopathic business. And you pointed out in your book that it was sort of difficult or took time to actually build up your clientele. A lot of people knew um, your husband, Elf Jacker, was a big name and wanted to see Elf, and so it took you some time to establish your own practice and. When you did and you started doing well, you also then made the decision or the choice to throw your energies into building the curriculum and also into facing off a lot of the challenges that the natural therapies were under in the 1970s and 80s. I mean, I was looking at various acts that you were coming your way, committees such as the Web Committee, there was a dietetic bill in the 1980, draft standards and vitamins and minerals and the therapeutic sorry, the Therapeutics Goods Bill and and um, homeopathic remedies were placed on the poisons list. So <laughs> as, as someone who was at the forefront um, of putting the case for natural therapies at this time, do you think that these various political challenges were driven by the needs of the patient? Uh, I think particularly by the increasing popu popularity of natural therapies, uh, and by sort of, we'll take the dietetic building from 1980. The dietitians were worried that we were taking over their job, that we were teaching nutrition, we were becoming more and more popular. And so that's how that bill, and somebody alerted us to the fact that we, it had a clause in it in the new one. So when they reviewed that bill at one stage, they decided that this was a dangerous paragraph. And, and, and fortunately, somebody alerted us to it, so I went to a QC, and he said, well, yes, if this was legislated in Parliament, 
it would mean you couldn't advise anybody to even boil an egg. Um, and so we fought it. And uh, uh, Tom Roper was the opposition health minister at the time. And uh, but eventually, it was uh, it was really quite funny some of the way that the people responded, and some of the best people that helped us were women in Parliament, not that there were that many then. And I suppose that's because of their natural interest in diet and healing and the, that sort of area. Um, so that was our first challenge. And then we had the draft standard on vitamins and minerals, which meant that they had allowed only a tiny amount to, to, that was allowed to be given to each patient. It was a ridiculous limitation that would have been placed on us. And I'm just thinking, now, who would, have, who would you see there as being this one that pushed that? Uh, I think it might have still come initially from the dietitian people. There's another way of them getting back, getting their area cleared. Um, but so it sort of went on and became more and more specific until it got to the Therapeutic Goods and Cosmetic Bill. <clears throat> and then... Uh, then the inquiry into alternative medicine and the health food industry. It's the first time the chairperson of that committee, the Social Development Committee of the Victorian Parliament, actually praised us for uh, doing a, a good job <laughs> in terms of... Uh, she, she considered we were making a valuable contribution. They, they didn't want to register us or anything, but it was a valuable contribution. So that was a big step forward, um, so it sort of went from... So that was over a fairly short period of time, from 1980 to 86, when the inquiry into alternative medicine and the health food industry was started. So uh, was some element of turf warfare in there, you think, as um, um, not necessarily the patient-centric type um, uh, drivers behind some of those challenges to the... Oh, a lot of it was political, yes, Absolutely. Judy, back in the 1970s, I noticed that you developed your own migraine tablet and you were using things like valerian and vervain and motherwort and mistletoe and, yes. and other things. And, and you describe elsewhere in your book trialling various herbs as being a bit like a cook in the kitchen. Can you tell us about the visit by the Labor Party politician Barry Jones? That was unfortunate. That was an inspection of our college, which was at that stage in a beautiful old home Heritage Home in Kew, and so the Barry Jones led this committee, and uh, it came to visit one afternoon, and they were all m m mulling around and joking with each other. So I, <laughs> so when they said to me, "How did I prepare the herbs?" I said, "Oh, well, a bit here and a bit there, like cooks in the kitchen." Well, that was reported in Hansard, and it was in Parliament, and so. It was unfair in a way because they'd all been joking, but I wasn't allowed to joke. I had to be reported as being some strange lady who worked like a kitchen maid. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, it's, it strikes me that you've, you've um, spent a lifetime learning about these herbs and therapies, which perhaps generations ago, this sort of knowledge would have been handed down to us by our mothers and grandmothers. Exactly. That's true. Why do you think that we've lost this connection with nature and this knowledge about how to heal ourselves naturally? Oh, I think, it's, unfortunately, it gets back to the greed and the disp dissipation of the average person, of the lack of focus in people's lives, and uh, I think that's a major problem, um, that they just haven't got that focus on nature and what we're doing to our bodies. And I think we, uh, we're looking to have a very serious problem with children. It's interesting the work that's being done on autism now in respect to um, electromagnetic frequencies and exposure to microwaves um, for, for, so that children are going to suffer from in terms of autism. So it's, um, uh, it's, there are just so many areas we could be researching that are in, valuable and necessary for our future health of the next generation. Are you seeing uh, sort of a more of a growth or more support for the naturopathic Way, philosophy and way of thinking? In one sense, yes, I'd say. Um, I'd say there's a bigger minority group all the time developing, but um, 
I still get back to the big business greed thing on for the majority of people. They, they can't, they're just not prepared to give up any of that freedom to exploit themselves in other ways. Um, Judy, you have your patients. I'm sure you have a, a steady stream coming to your uh, clinic or practice. And um, one in 10 Australians visits a naturopath. Why do you, what do you think that the public attitudes are towards natropo- naturopathy? Do you think that they're changing? Well, I think it's a lot more than one in 10 that attend, and it's 60 percent of 60 or 66 percent of people take natural therapies. Many of those would just buy them from health food stores after reading or hearing about them. But nevertheless, it's a big proportion of the public, and we were we alerted politicians to this decades ago, and the fact that we could make a lot more money for the government if they took a note of that huge majority of people that now visit a naturopathic or have naturopathic remedies. Um, so, um, sorry, what was your other bit of the question? Um, I guess what you, how do you see public attitudes towards naturopathy um, in the media and so forth? Well, I think there is a lot more tolerance um, for people uh, listening to those talking about natural therapies and, and a lot more interest. Um, it's, the, it's the, the problem is the financial side of it. Now, in, on April the 1st, they're going to remove rebates for naturopathic consultu- consultations that were right across the board of all types of naturopathic treatment, whether it's ac- not so much acupuncture, that's the exempt because they're registered lucky things. Um, no, it's um, herbalists, homeopaths, iridologists, bodywork people. I think massage might be exempt, remedial massage. So on April the 1st, people will no longer be able to take their receipts to their health fund and get a rebate. Um, so that that's because naturopathy is not a registered, is that registered or regulated? Is that... Well, this is the anomaly of the situation that uh, uh, I think it's broader than that. I think it's, a, a le- I think it's the, the, the government thing of, of not being able to regulate its finances adequately. Um, Various managers and presidents and of naturopathic groups have worked out how much money the government would save. Well, take, for instance, hospital admissions and medical treatment. Uh, that could be so much helped by having simple remedies that cost hardly anything, and then that would help improve our financial coffers for the government. So with the various managers, as I say, and presidents have looked at this in detail and, and tried to persuade the government that this is a, a, a good reason for registering and supporting natural therapies. Um, I think one of the big things is the research that's now done that wasn't done before, um, and that's why we're sort of happy, that's why the Jacker Foundation is happy to support um, places like Nickham. And Judy, um, what do you uh, um, is registration critical? Do you think for the future of naturopathy? Well, I think it's critical in the sense that the other professions dealing with health are registered, and um, you would expect that sooner or later the naturopaths would be able to have that privilege, and it's not even should be considered a privilege. Yeah. A logical conclusion to their efforts, I suppose you could say. Um, so it's hard to imagine that, for, that that it won't happen sooner or later. I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime, since I'm 80. But um, I should think um, certainly by the end of this century, things might have moved along a bit. And, and what do you think the future is for natural therapies in the healthcare system? Integration. I think the integration of naturopathic uh, work with allopathic work is, is the way in the future to go. And it's just a matter of a fair dealing with both sides of the question, whether it's allopathic or naturopathic. Um, 
but but I think integration. Well, I did. I worked with integration in terms of my original integration and synthesis of the herbs and vitamins and minerals and clinical nutrition, etc., and body work. And uh, and now we need to continue integrating, but also integrating with medical work. Judy, um, final question for you. Um, when a patient comes in to see you in your, in their practice um, or in your practice, um, do you do an iridology test and or how long do you take to do a consult with them? Well, I like to allow up to an hour and that includes going through the remedies, explaining them as well as all the diagnosis things we use. Um, unfortunately, iridology is one of those things that's not continuing to be taught. I've that's in with the disappointment of how the naturopathic philosophy subjects changing. Um, but I take I, I allow an hour per person and take a very careful history, which involves their, their food intake, their three meals, their sleep situation, their energy, uh, exercise, um, and and. Usually by the time I walk out the door, it does take an hour to do it properly. And Judy, do you, do you have a sort of a, um, a, a, a sort of a psychic way of assessing? Do you get sort of uh, intuition about things or is it all developed purely on what you see in front of you and um, the information that you're given? Well, I wouldn't, I'd probably call it intuition rather than psychism, um, although you come across the odd naturopath who is psychic, and that's interesting but not essential. Uh, so I, I think there's a good log logical basis for the use of natural therapies and, um, and, in, and, and common sense. Uh, and so I'd see it both as... In, in, and then you get the intuitive flair sometimes for a particular remedy, homeopathic remedies, homeopathic potencies, etc., um, so it's a mixture. Yeah, I'm sure that there's a, a lifetime of knowledge that you've um, built up and um, that is very hard to replace. Um, it has been an absolute delight to talk with you today and I'd like to thank you for being part of the Raw Podcast. Thank you, Greta. Raw is a podcast by Greta Pools. Subscribe to Raw The Nature Cure where you get your podcasts or visit the website, all one word, rawthepodcast.com. <laughs>